sake of the devil, that they shall appear. We're not here because we're free. We're here because we're not free. There's no escaping reason, no denying purpose. Because as we both know, without purpose, we would not exist. Chief, mate, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. My God, it would be beautiful. This is the World Magic Movement. Tonight's episode, Destinies. My name's S. Rob, and I'm here to talk to Saul Ravencraft about numerology. Absolutely. Um, numerology is something that I work with quite a bit, uh, and the things that I do... Uh, when I began my trip down the rabbit hole, and I, I actually got involved in all of this to prove that it wasn't true. I was uh, uh, very skeptical. I was uh, very arrogantly skeptical. And I had been challenged to not just sit back and, uh, and judge things, but to try them. And I had a few leading experiences that caused me to take a more serious uh, examination of, of all of what I consider to be paranormal and to look at it not just from the standpoint of something that was amusing, but something that really had an impact on humans. And numerology was where I began that. I figured, well, uh, numbers are going to be numbers. Uh, they're not going to be open to all of the sorts of crazy interpretation that you might get with tarot or something like that. I mean, the numbers are going to say what they say. And I sat down, I got a book on numerology, a solid book on numerology, I felt, that examined the concept in a logical way and showed different ways of working with it. And I started running some numbers that were relevant to myself. And I went, huh, that was weird. Because it, it said things uh, that were were very specific to my situation at that time. And actually, it, it caused me to think about things that were going on and what was at the root of some of those things. And after examining the numbers and looking at them this way and that way, I actually found myself making changes uh, and what I was doing based on what the numbers said to me. Now, from the skeptical perspective, uh, one could go, well, uh, you simply ran the numbers and it caused you to think about things a little differently and the numbers didn't have anything to do with it, really. You just opened those parts of your thoughts. From a practical standpoint, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> a good impact on me. And I began to dig more deeply into my examination of the numbers. And as I started branching out into other things like tarot and, and uh, other kinds of um, elements that I work with and in ritual magic and that sort of thing, the numbers continued to be at the core there. Uh, numbers and elements are the two things that sort of form the foundations of anything that I do and how I look at anything. And yeah. you know, so the, the, the number of numerology is is fairly straightforward concept, uh, and it dates back to uh, at least uh, the days of Pythagoras, uh, whose students uh, gave some thought to this sort of thing. And it is the idea that numbers, uh, the numbers that show up around us uh, and the numbers that are connected with us, uh, reveal uh, energies, reveal vibrations, reveal information about what's going on with us. And that you can use those numbers to understand what your environment is, what your context is. And you can also use those numbers to figure out how you need to balance what's going on out with what you want to go on. Uh, so it's, it's not just something that, that tells you uh, what's happening. Uh, you're not just doomed to whatever the numbers tell you. There are ways uh, w with just about any form of divination, uh, any form of uh, magical practice, the idea is to balance out what you see with what's required to, to manifest your intention. 
And so that's the way I work with numbers. And it's been interesting. They've continued to be very solid. Uh, when I need to do quick readings, uh, on occasion, I'm called upon to do readings for parties. Uh, people have never had fortune telling. They think it'll be fun. And they always say, we want you to keep it light. Don't get in anything heavy. And of course, at a party, I would never go deep into something very personal with somebody. But I find that the numbers have been a very quick way to do that. Uh, I have uh, something that is based on a grid system. Uh, that I learned from a uh, gentleman from New Zealand named Richard Webster uh, that he calls Chinese numerology. Uh, I haven't been able to track it down exactly what its its roots are, but it takes numbers and lines them up on a grid in a way that shows you the weight of numbers in certain applications. So it's sort of like Cartesian coordinates. It's sort of like, you know, an X and a Y is what you're doing when you're doing that, aren't you, really? So it's... No, not really. What you're doing is you are extracting numbers. Uh, for example, one of the most common numbers that we work with is our life path number. And anyone can compute this number right now if you want to. Uh, you want to stack up the day, the month, and the year of your birth and add all those numbers together. And you're going to come up with a number, probably a four-digit number. And then uh, that number is going to be greater than nine. We're aiming for numbers from one to nine. And so what you'll do is you'll add all those digits together. And if that is greater than nine, you'll add those digits together again until you get a number that is from one to nine. There are a couple of special numbers that we take note of 11 and 22 are very powerful numbers that we take note of so if those come up we make note of them uh, but then go ahead and reduce it down for a lot of interpretation and this is your life path number uh, my life path number uh, is a uh, is a one and one is very much about independence one is very much about uh, personal ambition and entrepreneurship uh, it, it uh, also uh, is a number that creates a lot of challenge in collaboration and cooperation and being able to work with teams and groups now, that doesn't mean that I can't work with teams and groups but I have to do it on purpose uh, someone with say a two is their number uh, has a very natural ability to connect with other people and to uh, team and collaborate and so that comes much more easily to them uh, but they have to work a little harder on doing things more independently they have to work a little harder on getting themselves out there on uh, following their personal ambition because their instinct is to try and set that evenly with someone else well that makes it hard to compete it's really about cycles in the universe more than numbers it is it is yeah. and when we uh, when we combine things for example one of the exercises i did at the beginning of the year and i did it just sort of as an exercise because someone had asked me about it and i took a day and ran numbers on a lot of things having to do with 2016. And that included just the general overlook of what the year was going to be. And of course, the United States election was in process at that point. Uh, there were really four players that were uh, considered front runners uh, at that time. Uh, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, um, uh, Hillary Clinton and Ted Cruz and of course we all know how that panned out in the election but what I did was I took the birth dates for each of the candidates and I combined it with the birth date for the United States which is recognized on July 4th 1776 uh, there's a historical context that says well that may not be the exact right number but that's generally the one that we run with as sort of the birthday for our country so I combined those numbers and, and saw what each one of those gave. And I didn't pursue it from there. I really should have because what I noticed is I went back and looked at that January article. I recapped it in an article I wrote recently uh, right after the election. Uh, everything that those numbers said basically played out. It showed that the two top 
candidates who had the greatest connection with the energy of the United States at this point was Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Yeah, and lots of power of cycles and numbers and yeah. And and what it, what the numbers said is that Sanders would succeed if he continued to cooperate, to collaborate with his supporters, and he did not give in to the game, uh, didn't start playing the same game as his opponents, that he stuck to his base, he stuck to that collaborative base. And, of course, you saw when he started playing the official political game, uh, he was out. Yeah. Uh, that ran him over. Um, Trump's numbers uh, showed that he was a, a likely winner. Uh, he had uh, th- there was a, a something that came up uh, where I used the word destiny. There was a real lineup uh, between Trump and and the country's vibration, and uh, it was it was strange the way that it lined up because at the time I. I never imagined that Trump had a, a chance uh, to be a nominee, uh, let alone uh, winning the election. Uh, and uh, and I was surprised at every step of the way as he continued to move forward. But when I went back and looked at the numbers, the numbers said, well, if he's not up against Sanders, uh, he's got a good chance of taking this thing. Um, and uh, the numbers the numbers continued to, to play out what, uh, what each of the candidates, uh, what happened to them. And, and the race as well. If I'm just talking, that's an important point, and that is that that people realise that this stuff is very useful, not just neurology but astrology and prediction. A lot of the occult is useful for strategies and business purposes because it's still an underused area where people don't really realise it's helpful to them. It is, and the important thing is to understand how to use it. Uh, the numbers will tell you about the environment. It'll tell you about the context of what is happening and what is going on with your goal. The same thing with astrology. They will tell you about the context of what is going on with you and what the natural vibration, the natural energy that is going on with something that you're trying to achieve or something that you're doing or something that is around you. Now, you're not stuck with whatever that says. We still have free will, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. We get to apply that free will in the actions that we take, and we get to balance out what the numbers tell us, what the astrology tells us, with what we need to succeed. It's really also a matter of the practitioner, because you get some people who do give the impression, not people who aren't really very good at it, frankly, that this is it, you've got no choice, sort of thing, and that's not right at all. Uh, And if I actually wrote something, it was called Date Divination. And it's funny you mention this because it's smack in the middle between numerology and astrology. Sure. It's not really either, but it's sort of both. It relies on on cycles. And it's a system that it really harks back to a lot of very ancient like, ideas of uh, what, day, what day, a certain day of the week was for and things like this. And I had actually a lot of success with that. And a lot of people have, that have bought the book, it's been out a long time now, a lot of years now. Uh, but a really good response to it. And funny enough, I think that you're right, because numerology is something which is still not as well used as it should be. But when people do use it, they assume that you don't need somebody to help them. And to a large extent, certainly if it's something like corporate or an important decision, it's a good thing to get somebody in to do that. Yeah, So they get that, that extra help, so they get the most they can out of it. Because often part of this is still interpretation, you know what I mean? Part of this is still about... Uh, your own experience and things like this, just as it would be for like an astrologer or, you know, and, and things like sure. that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Although I've always considered myself to be a sort of a gateway mystic. Uh, I, I think that everyone should feel emboldened to uh, do something with these tools up to the point that you can uh, because otherwise, how do you how do you gain the experience? How do you how do you get to the point that you uh, you know what questions you really want to ask? Uh, and I I think numerology is a wonderful place to begin. Now, of course, what I bring when I do numerology readings, uh, like you said, is that experience. Uh, I've seen some of these patterns before. Uh, I've seen some of these connections. I've seen ways that that people balance this out. 
And so for me, it's not it's not a first time search. It's not my first rodeo, uh, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and uh, but at the same time, I always encourage anyone that I do readings for uh, to not just to not just take my word for it. And to not be dependent on me, to spend some time with the numbers, to spend some time looking at some of these things themselves and to understand it better, uh, and and then to, to use me as additional guidance when, like you said, there's something important or there's something that doesn't make sense. Uh, or or something that that they're too close to they can't uh, they can't look at it objectively at all uh, I think one thing that is wonderful is is an experienced practitioner has the ability to sit outside your situation and look at it and that can help a lot it does yeah and I think that's the important thing what happens now is that in the occult generally in all forms of uh, you know of of uh, witchcraft and the power, even sort of black magic and white magic, is that it's not as hidden. You know, for my situation, I learned it when I was quite young because my grandmother did it, but I realise that most people don't. And so, what you you know, but now people can learn it more and people really, I really feel people do need this knowledge. The occult is better when it's shared than when it's hoarded. You know? I agree. I agree. And I think right now we're we're seeing that. Um, and I, I don't mean to to deal with politics, but but I think it, it's very relevant to what we're talking about. Um, when the election happened, a lot of people focused their energy in a particular direction. I had a lot of people that I know that found themselves uh, driven into utter despair, and they they were deeply depressed, deeply angry. And had such a sense of helplessness about it all. And my perspective on dealing with what we'll call occult matters, the paranormal, is it has taught me that I have a lot more control over what manifests in my world than anyone ever told me. Yeah, and that's the thing, isn't it? We all get told, you know, even if you start the occult very young, we all get told that... Uh, that we are just an earthly husk, that there's nothing else, that you don't really have any power, you're just part of like a large beehive, and actually it's not true at all, you know. Humans have the ability even to change the fabric of the world that's around them, to manifest beings, all types of things. We Absolutely. What we are told we're supposed to do, or, be, or to be able to be. And, you know, I feel it's important that we do that en masse, not just us that are already doing it, but other people as well, you know. This is our chance, humanity, to ascend. This is the time, really, onto a higher level. You know, not just in the occult, but also technologically and scientifically. You know, and we all need to try and push forward to try and get humanity where it needs to be. Because I feel it's an either up or a down situation, you know. We either ascend or who knows what could happen, you know. There's many problems with the environment and all types of things. Same thing to be almost playing out like an end of days if you think about it. Well, we're not quite there yet. You know, this is the time when we need to really embrace our full set of powers and not be convinced of the smallness of what we're supposed to be. Because no one's really small. We all have no. incredible powers. We just need to embrace it, and that's the important thing. And the people out there as well, the people listening to this, you know, you need to embrace your full set of powers. If you do that and you're prepared to use all of your abilities, not just your occult ones, but your other ones as well, life will be so much better. And I speak from personal experience. It does improve my life, many other people's lives. Agreed. Agreed. And I think where where you begin to do that is first accept the idea that you could manifest, that you could change something, that this is not crazy, this is not above you or beyond you, that you can actually do this. And then start with something simple. Start with something that feels attainable and explore one of these ideas explore one of them that you are attracted to in the beginning i was attracted to numerology but that's not all that i did i moved beyond that but numerology felt very attainable to me it felt like something that i could understand and something that i could execute just by following the instructions 
And what I began to discover as I tapped into that was I found the correspondences, the sort of harmonious vibrations between what I was learning there and what lay in the other practices that I had seen to the side of that. And all of them are related. Numerology and astrology have definite connections when you can see them. Uh, and the tarot has connections to all of this. Uh, and ritual magic or uh, other kinds of occult practices all have connections into these things. So wherever you start is going to be a doorway that connects to all of them yeah. if you so choose. Exactly. If you're exploring the circle, it doesn't matter where you begin. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Even with occultism, I do feel some people still think that it's sort of separate. Like things like voodoo were somehow separate for everything. Yeah. But in my experience of like exploring things to do with uh, folk saints and things like this, is that really, if you add Christianity into anything, it's anything which is a, which is, isn't a Western occultism, it tends to become quite like voodoo. You know, even if we think about the pre-Columbian god Mam, who became San Simon. Uh, basically, San Simon was a guy and. All the other men of his village went away hunting and he stayed and had sex with everyone's wife. And the men came back and chopped his arms and legs off. And the idea was that he was possessed by this pre Columbian god man. But as soon as you add in uh, that he's a folk saint, it actually, as an occultist, I can see that it's actually quite close to voodoo. And when you think about it, the only thing it has in common is that occultism and that you've got this Christian element added. But, you know, it, so things do connect, even things that seem completely different, that even occultists tend to think aren't the same or somehow are sort of separate. They never really are. You know, it all connects together. Certainly, certainly. And many people don't recognize many of the uh, sort of more esoteric, more occult connections within Christian ritual. Uh, for example, if you go into a Catholic church um, and you look, the corners, the cardinal corners are marked with a candle. Yeah. The altar is placed in the traditional location. The implements of the altar are, are the traditional implements of magic. Uh, a, a, a cathedral is a magic circle. Yeah. And also, if you look at the direction, churches are always built in the direction of the rising sun. And if yes. you think you've got the Son of God... But if you also look at the Pope, uh, Enki is a Sumerian, a very ancient Sumerian god, okay? Uh, but if you look at how he's dressed in these later sort of stones, he's dressed like the Pope, or rather the Pope is dressed like Enki. Because originally he was just a really strong guy with wings and a beard, and then he sort of lost the wings, and then he gained like a hat which looks like a fish's head. And then he's got, you know, and, he, and he's got this other thing. So basically the Pope is dressed up like an ancient Sumerian god. <laughs> the notice, so there's an awful lot there. But Enki was also linked to the sun. As well as being water, he was also said to come from the sun. So you got the idea again of a sun god, which means that Christianity could well be really about, uh, about Ra, an Egyptian god, and Enki, just relabeled, just with a different name. Well, and I, I encourage anyone who is casting their nets a little bit on, uh, on spirituality to view a set of interviews that Bill Moyers did with Joseph Campbell called The Power of Myth. Uh, Joseph Campbell uh, was an anthropologist. He was a student of Carl Jung, and he basically looked at all of mythology, all ages, all cultures. And he had a wonderful way of extracting some of the patterns and some of the ideas from these mythologies without turning them into superstition. Yeah. Much like, like Jung could, could look at the uh, the archetypes and those kinds of things uh, see these patterns these psychological patterns and still find it wonderful uh, st still be awed by it uh, Campbell does the same thing with mythology and one of his ideas uh, is that all of these 
basic concepts of spirituality, uh, all, all of these things that people need are repeated in every single one of these established myths in every age and every culture. Now, they're rearranged. The stories are a little different. Uh, and so some of them t explain certain ideas to you in different ways. So you have to really deeply study the one that you select uh, in order to understand it all. But that that there is something deeply human about these ideas and that we need them. And if, if, uh, if we don't have them through some sort of a, a spiritual practice, we'll recreate them in comic books or something like that yeah. because we need them. <laughs> we need, well, need those ideas. There's actually a lot of occult uh, that is hidden in quite uh, easy and, and well-known stories. A good, uh, an obvious example, well, not so obvious to many people, is Rumpelstiltskin. That was originally called Tom Tit Tot. Mm -hmm. His actual fact, uh, the Brothers Grimm, they were collectors of these tales. They'll go back a lot further. And if you remember in it, it, at the end, it's all about whether we can find, whether the woman can find the name Rumpelstiltskin or Tom Tip Todd. Now, yeah. people don't realise what it's not about is, it's basically about the idea that if you know a character, know uh, an entity's true name, that you can command it. Now, at the time, everyone would have known that when it when it was, I suppose, for much of its existence. But now people don't get that the whole point of knowing the name Rumpelstiltskin is because then you can command him, you have control of him because you know his name. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, if you think about it, you can go back to the work of Abraham and the Mage, and you've got sort of magic squares, and what you're using there, basically, is the name of the particular demon involved. And you, but you're basically doing the same thing. It's basically just a version of Rumpelstiltskin. It's just a different version. Making it into a talisman. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it, it connects and there's a lot of stuff hidden in there as well. But you're right, there's a tremendous amount in folklore as well. Uh, and things. I mean, I know something that's very interesting to me is an old folk tale that's from south of England. And what it says is there was a woman and she wasn't paying attention in church. And what they say is a great big ball of fire crashes through the church and then it opens up and some, as they put it, some demons walk around, they get back in and then the devil comes down the horse and he grabs the woman over his shoulder and he gallops off and the ball of fire goes into the sky. And that's an English folk tale. I mean, you could, you could think of it however you want, but it does seem a bit strange that when you think about it that you've got basically a UFO abduction in very old folk tale, way before anyone thought about UFOs. Sure. Hundreds of years old, you know. It's uh, There's a lot in there. But, of course, there's also a hidden a lot as well. There's a lot in there which which is just stuff, you know, to make it interesting. Well, and I think that's one of the challenges we have when we look at some of these ideas. I remember having a conversation with someone who was uh, very deeply involved with um, Sasquatch lore and uh, werewolf lore and, and other similar kinds of uh, mysterious hairy creatures. And at one point in our conversation, uh, this was kind of a... a interview situation, I brought up the idea that in Native American lore and various other lores from tribal cultures, there are these ideas along the lines of uh, totem animals, uh, spirit animals that connect with us. And they don't, uh, they don't necessarily exist in this plane. Uh, they're, they're spirit. And so we encounter them, but they aren't physically real the way that, that we tend to uh, experience reality. They're, they're on the edge of our reality. And she, uh, she said, oh, yes. Uh, uh, and, and we continued talking about that and how this sort of spiritual nature of these creatures might be why it's so difficult to find physical evidence of them, even though people clearly have profound experiences with them. And then later on, uh, when we were doing sort of our, our post chat uh, after it was over, she said, you know, I, I don't usually talk about that in front of people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you made me do that. Um, and that 
I think is is an interesting crossover because if you're looking at cryptozoology, cryptozoology, purely as strange creatures walking around, and you have no connection with this idea of interdimensional, interplanar, interspiritual beings, then those are two completely separate ideas that could never overlap. But the fact that she was knowledgeable enough about lore to be connected with the totem animal concepts and the spirit animal concepts, she could see that as a possibility. And I think that that's true in many occult things. There are things that when you focus on a particular detail, you see them as very separate, as very, very siloed. But when you start to broaden your view, you look for the correspondences, you will find bizarre connections between, uh, say, UFO and certain kinds of astrological things and, and other sorts of uh, occult understandings. I, it, it, none of it is, is, uh, is in its own container. Uh, that, that's a container we put around it so that we can sell the book in the, in the bookstore. But all of these things in reality are intertwined uh, and, and overlapping. Uh, and I think the, the most benefit is derived by being open to all of it and looking for those connections. Yeah, I do feel you're right there, yeah. I mean, the thing is, everything really flows from the occult. It all started out just as sort of magic when you think about it with a mm-hmm. real sign, so a lot of it does flow from that. But it's partly, I think, because a lot of the occult things have been pushed in there over the years that people haven't wanted, and people are trying to distance subjects from it. And the more you do that, the more you leave over, you know, the more they leave behind of their own subject. You know, and that's why everything seems to connect with the occult in some way or another. Yeah, you know, I mean, see, there isn't really a part of the world, a part of life which I can't in some way think of it's being attached to the occult, you know? Uh, and what you said about things becoming open occult is uh, an old term that talks about things that are secret, things that are hidden. And things are opening. Uh, a lot of information is out there that uh, would never have been available to the average individual. Uh, even Aleister Crowley, as he went further on in his life, understood the need to pull the pull the covers off of some of this stuff and as you watch his writing moving forward it becomes less and less obscure and more about I want everyone to do this everyone needs to do this uh, whereas in the beginning he was uh, very much tied up in the in the secret club kind of approach to things and I think that that has really been a lot of our problem with manifesting over time is for for good reasons a lot of this had to be hidden because there were powerful people that were very dependent on the idea that you were subject to them and you were afraid of them and you could manifest nothing without them and so you have to uh, you have to do that in secret uh, but i think as our world has uh, shrunk uh, as technology and all of these things have uh, progressed and we have a lot more individual power available to us than we used to that these things are starting to bubble up. Um, now, of course, it's all kind of blended together, and it's very difficult, I think, for the absolute amateur, uh, well, absolute amateur, uh, I guess we're all pretty much amateurs, <laughs> um, but uh, the absolute beginner to discern uh, what is uh, what is coded and what is literal and what is important and what was put there just to... Um, put speed bumps in front of people that weren't serious. Um, you know, the, the, it's good to have someone to help you discern all that. But the thing that makes the most difference is to start trying things. Don't just think about it. Don't just look at it. Do something. Yeah, because you do get some people that sort of, uh, they're almost like book collectors, and they want to collect books in the occult, but they don't really want to do it. And I always say you really need to not just read the books, but try it out. But I have noticed a, a difference myself in some of the associations I'm in, the Institute of Magic in Brazil is basically an occult, psychical and paranormal research society. 
but it's completely different to how a society would have been if it was 40 years ago or 20 years ago. It's very, it's got different grades and things like in a cult society. I'm sure. Afraid. But basically speaking, it's very open to people to learn things. That's what it's there for, to teach people. And it's got a large headquarters in Brazil, but it's very open. It wasn't that long ago that people were still very shut. And I do feel some people, I've noticed before, some occultists get what I do, because it is a convenient term. Uh, some occultists get what I do by the amount of books. I've wrote over 200 books now on the occult, and some of them get it that I'm sharing knowledge, but some of them still don't. Sure. I think some of them, it's still about the idea that they want to have a secret club. I don't even think, for those people, it's really even about the occult or about magic, if you want to use that term. Uh, although it is sometimes a bit confusing with people. So I prefer the term occultism. But Well, it's it's the typical human arrogance that assumes that we can stand in the way of someone's connection with the universe. Yeah, well, exactly. I think part of it is as well that if you have your own group, it's not just that you can exclude everybody else, but you can limit what you need to know. So if you're yeah. and you want to know only about Alistair Crowley, you can limit yourself to that, and that's a, a reasonable amount of knowledge. But for people who like are in more than one group or know more than one tradition, it's a much more open thing. It's uh, you know it's not a matter of you can limit yourself to this because the occult is huge and it bridges into other things. So you end up with occultism from all around the world, from some traditions that people don't even link into, and you see the connections and also the, the tensions that you get in different places. Uh, like, for instance, sigils used in like voodoo are quite different to a lot of other things. A lot of sigils, not all of them, but some of the vivis used in, in voodoo and some other traditions don't have anything around them. They don't need a circle or a square. Some do, but many of them don't. Now, a lot of occultism was always assumed you needed a circle around it to contain the energy. Mm -hmm. you really don't. But that was always the assumption. If you think it's one of those things, if you think you do, then you do. Do you know what? Yes. I'm teaching a, a workshop on Saturday on candle magic, and I'm using the, uh, the concept of candle magic to just look at, at working magic in general. And one of the things that, that I'm going to be bringing up a few times is that you know, for certain things, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be something special. You can use an emergency candle you bought at the gas station or something like that, if that's what you want to do, uh, if that's what you feel you need to do. Um, but if you've decided that it has to be a candle you've made, handmade out of beeswax yourself, well, will that add to what you're doing? Of course it will. You feel it does, and so whatever whatever you do that adds importance to it for you is is going to help you to engage more with the manifesting energy. Um, but it's not it's not the it's not the working that requires that. It's you that's requiring that. When you reach a certain level of maturity in what you're doing, you'll you'll just do what you need to do. You won't need your magic shoes. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. a lot of this power really is, a lot of magic is outside of us and within, a lot within us. A lot of it is within. And a lot of it is in, sometimes when you get a deeper understanding, you need less than you did before. I don't know if that makes any sense, but sometimes you need less when you have a deeper understanding of it. When you, you know, when you connect the different traditions together, you can understand what the principles are and how it actually works, where up to a certain point, you get to the point where you're drawing your magic pictures and your things like this, but you're not really understanding it. But when you get further on, you understand that, oh, yeah, that's why I'm doing this. You know, and then you can do all sorts of things. You know, that, this is why I'm using this candle. That's why it's this shape. You know? Well, the, the rituals and the tools are, are implements that help us get our energy where it needs to be in harmony with what we're trying to manifest. And uh, when you're beginning, when you're first 
beginning to to understand and connect and figure out how to do this, you may need a lot of help. You may need a lot of encouragement. You may need a lot of reinforcement that this is really, really going to work. And I tell you, if you go through all of the work to manufacture the implements and get just the right day and time to do something out of the Kia Solomon, you have put a lot of effort into making this thing happen, and it had better work (laughs) with everything you put into it. Um, But I think that what happens is if if you are someone who is not sure, all of these tasks and all of these requirements that you fulfill, uh, all of these uh, speed bumps and thresholds that you go through, uh, they they encourage you, they help you to know, well, gosh, something important must happen after all this work and all I've spent on making this happen. And and you walk into it with with a, a strong intention and uh, and and that really helps to, to manifest. But later on, uh, when when this becomes more natural to you, uh, you know, you, you need less and less encouragement and you just do it. Absolutely. Okay, great to hear from you, Sol Ravencroft. Thank you so much, S. Rob. Let's do it again soon. Well, I'm S. Rob, and I'm here with Freddie Valentine. Hi, Freddie. Hello, Rob. How are you doing today? You all right, mate? Yeah, great, yeah. And we're just here to talk about the sphere of destiny. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And that's a great... It's called... Also called the Holy Spirit or the Lance of Longitudinous. Mm, yes, many names. It's, it's a well-known thing, isn't it? It's a well-known uh, mystical object. It's very well known. Yeah, I'll just explain a little bit about it for people. It's basically the spirit that went in the side of Jesus when he was crucified. It's mentioned in the Bible in Gospel of John. Although there's a little bit of difference about the interpretation, some people say that the Romans came, and at this point he was already, Jesus was already on the cross, he was nailed and he had the crown of thorns, and someone had already given him a drink of water. And it was it's said that the Romans came to break Jesus' legs, something they did to hasten death. Yeah. That the soldier called Longinus, and he stabbed him in the side to see if he was dead. Some people actually say that he stabbed him in the side so that he would be saved from having to have his legs broken, so that it would be uh, a better death rather than have his legs broken and die that way. So that's the two interpretations there. Yes. Yeah, an interesting thing is, though, is that really this couldn't have happened in any other system of belief because, I don't know if you know anything about Christianity, but Jesus is supposed to be fully human and fully God. So what you've got is a figure not going in the side of... Uh, of a demigod, but going in the side of an actual god. Yeah. Yeah, so that's from, from this framework, what you've got is that the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all the same, all the same person. So you've got a sphere going in the side of the actual created god is what you've got from this system. And yes, that's right, yeah. And it, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, so what happened as well is you had a mixture of the blood and the water. Now, some people say that this is actually part of what the Catholic math is about. But it's actually about that mixing of blood and water, that it's not really about the Last Supper. It's actually about that. So a lot of it comes from, the math actually comes from the sphere of destiny and the use of it. So, you know, it's very central to, you know, to Christianity, to a lot of people as well. And because of that, it picks up a lot of power. Now, we did look into this, didn't we, yeah, and we found that the one with the best, uh, the most provenance, the real one, uh, was the one in Vienna, yeah, the Vienna sphere. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and basically, the Holy Lance, the Spear of Destiny, is a level one holy relic. Now, this is important to remember, it's a level one, and it's the only level one holy relic, so it's the most powerful one that there is. It's so powerful that anything that touches it becomes a level three holy relic. Which is, actually, yeah. yeah, that's really quite phenomenal. And uh, as you remember, I did think the Holy Lance, the Holy Spirit, was going to be stolen. It was going to be 
And we and actually it was because we stole it, didn't we? But we did. Yes, that's right. On the astral plane. On the astral plane, yeah. So we didn't do anything wrong. There's no law breaking there. You know, we're all in the clear. Uh, and we did like a ritual that I wrote, and it used Pat the Legba. And he's actually uh, uh, the voodoo man. They say that without him, no voodoo can take place. But he's also... That's right. Yeah. And he's also St. Peter. Right. So he's... He, he's so very he, powerful. Very powerful person, isn't he, to have to open up the gateways like we had, you know. We, we did an astral um, astral robbery of, of the spirit of destiny, didn't we? So it's not, not a physical one, but it's an astral or spiritual robbery of it. And we took it ourselves. That's right, yeah. And what we did is we took some of that of its power and we tried to split it between spearhead with Shanghai, which is the Roman pillion spearhead and the letter opener. I don't know what's happened to the letter opener, but I do know that the spear that I have has manifested a miracle. Now, right. Yeah, and in the medieval period it was said that if it manifests a miracle, then that is, by God's will, uh, the actual item. So, so that's really good. But this was owned by Hitler, the one that that we stole, stole the energy from. And, right. Yeah, he, he did a lot of stuff with Vril, which has actually came from a book. And at the time, it said that nobody knew the difference between science fiction because it was the first sci-fi book. Uh, but the idea of Vril really comes from prana energy power. So there was a lot of ceremonies done that would give more energy, that would power it up, add to its power. And I don't know if you know this, but a lot of the people around here that actually literally the devil that the devil had possessed him and when he had the spear of destiny he was winning the war because it said whoever has a spear if you have that before an army or with you then you basically win it's you know it's sort of like the yeah the art of the covenant like that but obviously yes yeah but he didn't literally have it in front of armies but he did have it and he was winning the war and then one of uh, the nazi officers stole it and then he, he started to lose the war so it was an entire turning point of the war is the, the removal of the spear. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, the entire altering of everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, but the important thing is as well is that I can't stress with how powerful this is. This is an incredibly powerful thing. What I did think is I wanted to find a way to test it. And I thought, well, when holy relics normally, they put it on display, you know, a million people walk past and have so many miracles. Well, I thought, I can't really do that. So what I did was, I actually took uh, a photograph of somebody and I put this underneath the spear head, the spear, and I left it. And it did actually manifest a miracle. I've actually got a record of it. And this is in the guy's own words, yeah? Uh, yeah. First, I've got the date from here. So I did write it down. Uh, it was placed under uh, the photo of this guy. Jose Roberto Ramiro Abrahao, who was in Brazil, the time still at Brazil, was placed under on the 27th of August 2016 at 4 minutes past 12 a.m. and then it was removed on the 1st of September 2016 at 4.28 p.m. And this is in his own words of what he said. Jose Roberto Ramiro Abrahao, a.k.a. Mardi, if I'll explain about that later, author and Catholic priest I've got more clarity of the mind, feel more focused, and yes, I'm feeling with more power at each day. And let me tell you, I'm more than planning to open my own new Catholic church. Spiritual and mental power is growing up, I'm sure. And I've got a note here, the guy's called Mad Ear because he was basically you know, a big hero in his time, he's been a soldier. But he was also linked with a person called Raul Fayexas, which was a big celebrity star over there. And he was his composer. Yes. And so he wrote a lot of stuff for him. And so they all got the name mad, as they did as well. But after I moved it, some even more interesting stuff has happened. Because I assumed it was stopped at that point, you know what I mean, that when it was removed? Yes. But what's actually happened was, he got made into a bishop. He got ordained from being a priest to becoming a bishop. And right. He, yeah. And he's a member of the old Catholic Church, and that predates the alterations made by Rome. So that's nearer to the church how it actually was uh, when it first set up at the very start. And he is setting up his own church. And I've got a name of it. It's called the Catholic Apostolic Orthodox Ecumenical Liberal Church. All right. And that's the name of the church that he's setting up. Uh, so, I mean, 
to me, you can't get more of a miracle than that. That is a miracle. That's God's will speaking through the spear. Yeah, yeah. completely. I mean, when I did this, uh, you know, we did this together, because there's also Dan Beans was there, was there, did it as well, there was one of just us. That's right, yeah. The three of us. And I was just thinking to take the energy from the spear. I wasn't really thinking much further than that. And now, because of this, a new church is going to be set up by this guy who's now... And the thing is, because he's being made a bishop, he can ordain other people now. So it's not just him saying that, he's being made a bishop, he can ordain priests and people like that. You know, and that's something that normally uh, that would be difficult to do. I don't know if you know this, all the ordinations in the Catholic Church, all the Catholic churches, all go back to St. Peter. So if you go back to the old personal who day and day with the person who made him a bishop, and you trace it back, it'll go back to St. Peter. Now, as I said before, St. Peter uh, is also called in voodoo. He's called a voodoo man, and he's called Papa Legba, the person. Yes. The, the, the entity we use to do this with. So. Yes. I mean, I feel this is tremendous. I feel it too. I wasn't really expecting it to work that well, to be honest. I was expecting it to work, but I wasn't expecting, you know, uh, all this. Because this isn't just like a marginal miracle. This is a full-on miracle. I don't even... Yeah. Think, I mean, I don't know. Do you think any of the other uh, relics have even got anything to match this? Because it's I think it's probably the, the, the most powerful one. Yours is the Ark of the Covenant, which has got a lot of uh, energy and power to it. But, I mean, I feel that if you... Imagine if you had them all together, how powerful it would be. If you had them all together, you know, every single relic, or all the main relics like that, you know. Um, but obviously the spear is one of the most powerful ones there is. Yeah, it's huge, yeah. I mean, the thing is as well, anything that, is, that, the, that the relic touches, that the Spear of Destiny touches, becomes a relic. So it means that it's in a box, but the box has some felt in it, which I put in. So that piece of red felt is now a level three relic. Yeah. So that should manifest the power of the level three relics. Yeah. So, so it, you know, it just rolls on, doesn't it? It just, yeah. It just gets bigger and bigger all the time. It's just, it's, it's something that can expand upon it, do you know what I mean? Whatever's around it can, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Add to it, yeah. But I do feel we did the right thing. We were meant to do this. You know, it was a ceremony we were meant to do. You know, I mean, I know at the time we did, I mean, I had like a, a large stick with me. The idea was if anything happened that we wouldn't have to visualise anything on the astral realm. Now, although I've used it in magic before, it's been called the Titfield Thunderbolt. I didn't use yeah. it much before that. And it, I called it that after a, a, an old heal, healing film, because I'm not going to call it some sort of funny occult name. It's not the way I am. Yeah, sure. But in actual fact, uh, I feel that it was very easy. Because what I was thinking of, they may have wanted to make it look hard. You know what I mean? But they really didn't. It was it was pretty open. We were meant to do it, you know? Yes, you know, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know, it was like, uh, you know, the key was left in the ignition or the door was open, you know? It was made as easy as it possibly could be, you know? And what I think about this is, maybe this is a thing, maybe if it, the Vienna Spear, maybe the, the one that did have the power, what was that going to be used for? Because it, it would be in a very handy place for someone to steal and everyone to know about if you were uh, sort of a dictator or something. It's, you know, it's, it's right there. But now, it's there, but there's no power in it. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot that, you know, you can feel the energy of it straight away. The, the energy's very strong completely, isn't it? As soon as, you, as soon as you feel it, really. Oh, yeah, you do get used to being around it. But yeah. when you first have it, it, it is, it's sort of... It's sort of in a way unsettling. I don't know if you know, but you know when you summon an entity and it comes through full on. Yes. No how, no matter how long you've done it, you can become slightly unsettled. Not all the time, but occasionally. Where you can become a little bit unsettled. It, it was a bit like that. And having it around you at first was a bit like that. But you sort of get yes. used to it. It's all right now. It's like it's just part of the surroundings, you know. Exactly, yeah. It, it fits in. It'll fit in with the balance of it. Obviously, if it's something new, a new energy, if like anything that's new, it takes a while to sort of adjust to its surroundings and, and for us to adjust to it being there. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I think I will planning on, on doing this again with other pictures. Uh, but I think we need to be careful because we need to make sure that it's going the right direction because I don't, I don't want it to be used in any way for anything that could be considered evil or bad. I think we've got to make sure that it only gets used for the absolute, uh, you know, good things, right things that I'm not in any way trying to do anything with it. And I feel this, that's the right way to use it. You know, if I'd use it as a wand, people would expect us to use it for all sorts of stuff. We're putting things underneath. It's just like I'm sort of channeling the power, you know, yes. through the sphere. 
Yeah, definitely. And it is all about channeling the energy. That's what, so once you've got energy, it's almost like having electricity. If it's just there and no one's using that electricity, it's just, it's just wasted. But once you plug into it, and which is what you're doing, it's plugging into the power and using it and, and activating it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, uh, the Nazi occult society, I don't know what the name of it was, so until it was called the real occult society, whatever. But yeah. They did a lot of stuff to give it energy. And yes. I can actually understand why the Nazi officer stole the Spear of Destiny from Hitler. I can absolutely understand. There's no way could he have been left with that spear. That was, you know, that was the worst thing possible, was for God yes. to have the Spear of Destiny. Oh, yeah, the wrong hands. It's like anything, anything in the wrong hands is, is dangerous. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like people have to protect things like the spear and the ark. Do you know what I mean? From people that could use that for bad yeah. things. You know, if you've got people that have good intentions, almost like guardians of it. Do you know what I mean? There's something going yeah. into the wrong hands, almost like protecting it. Like, like yeah, the Knights Templar protecting things like this in the past. You need yeah. people now that protect this both in the in the material world and in the astral world as well. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I feel I'm the right person to have it. Because the thing is as well, I don't think that any of the sort of religious organisations would ever admit that an individual has it. Which is no. great because it means I can have it and use it and no one's going to bother about it. Yeah, but exactly. I also, but I was also thinking about like, the biblical things at the end of days. And I thought, what would happen if it was an end of days? Like, actually, like it is in the Bible, you know, they got a spider coming out of the ground with a human head. And all yeah, that. and all that, all that kind of stuff. And what I thought was, no church in the world would do anything. They would just sit there and say, you know, no, 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 you know, we were right. That's it. Yeah. You know, no one would do anything. Where, I'm just a guy, so if I got a spear of destiny and it happens, okay, you can't stab a spider with it, you know, with many use, but you could put something under it to try and... See, if yeah. you've got something, you know, you've got something, a fallback in the mechanism. So if anything happens to try and take over the world or anything happens, we've got this, we've got the spear yeah. now, put something underneath. You can make an attempt to do something, at least, at least, at least having an attempt or something to, to delay this or to affect it in some way, rather than sitting back and just sort of saying, well, yeah, I told you it didn't happen, yeah, which is what a lot of them would do. Oh, that's what, I do feel that was what they'd do as well, yeah, they'd just, yeah. Like, oh, well, we were right, you know. Because you're not prepared for it, you see. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's all right in the Bible saying, yeah, there's going to be this end of days, but it doesn't tell you how to stop it happening. It's almost in the Bible saying this is going to happen, there's nothing you can do about it. It's basically what the Bible says. Um, it doesn't really give any solutions or any ways to, to protect people, yourself from it, or protect the world from it. There's no actual solutions there. Yeah, and that means we're possibly being given a reprieve. You know? Yeah. It could be, it could be, you know, that this was all going to play out. And the spear of destiny being given to one blow is now a reprieve. Because mm. when you think about it, when you think about it, that could be quite central to it. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people could direct that power and cause all sorts of things to happen. But, you know, I really am pleased for the guy, because I really feel that not just as a miracle, but as a priest, it must be a great thing for him, you know, because he's done a lot of important work in his life. Yes. And now he's being made a bishop. And obviously... Uh, you know, they approve of what he wants to do by making him a bishop. So, you know, now he can uh, form his own church, or it's forming his own church. And, you know, it's also quite a liberal church as well. Although it's got the word orthodox in there, it's very liberal. And they approve of gay marriage and all sorts of things. So it's very in step with today, you know, as things are now. Yes. Yeah, and that, maybe that was a plan all along, you know, for this to happen and the spirit to get removed on the astral realm on the astral realm so that this guy can set up this church that it was all just about this you know we were just yeah. part of it exactly it just, just, just maybe we were yeah, pushed into doing that for a reason exactly yeah because you think about it it's a strange thing for people to think about doing isn't it yeah definitely you know I mean you, you don't normally wake up in the morning and think what a great idea we'll steal the spear of destiny I mean it would have been so easy when you think about it to be directed. Or, you know, just a whisper here, a whisper there before you know where you are. You know, you're doing, you're doing an astral arm robbery. Because it is, as far as I'm concerned, I do believe it's the first robbery on the astral realm. So, it sets a whole new thing. Now, it's never happened before. You know, yeah. so we are the world's first astral armed robbers. That's it. We can, you know, move power from one place to another. And yeah. there's other relics as well. Uh, not just in Christianity, but there's also Buddha's tooth and things like this. So there's a whole host of things. And at the moment, I'm just concentrating on this, you know. This is where I am now. And I'm hoping to do 
uh, to get more people and to try and put other people's pictures underneath and see what happens. Because the important thing is, you know, I only put one picture of the guy underneath. There wasn't like I put a million pictures and this one worked. This is the only one that went under. This is the first one. You know, yeah. the first one, you know, and it's a success. So I think that's actually great. I really do. Yeah, oh, it's great. It was a good success, and I thought the vibe was good. Um, and, it, and it was quite smooth, really. I suppose Papa Lego was there. Yeah, well, it was very smooth. You know, it, it went a lot easier than I thought it would have done. And what I'm thinking of, that any of the things that we had with us to visualise on the astral realm, if they had picked up any stray energy, because doing that, it does seem that the Titfield Thunderbolt, the, the staff, does seem to have more power now. I do do things with it, and it does seem to have a little bit more energy than I had before. You know, I've yeah. really done much with it at that point, I must admit. So it's energised you up as well, giving you some energy from it, or taking some energy from it. I do feel sort of stronger and, you know, better than I was, you know. Uh, it just feels like things are moving in my direction. But I don't really think it's for me. I think yeah. in this case, for the guy who has it, he's the one person that it isn't for. It's for everybody else. You know, but yeah, but I you know I really do hope that that more miracles are performed. With that. I do hope that the other ones work. You know, and I will be looking for a, a picture of someone that I, I think has a, has a good energy, someone that I feel is going there that it's going to work for the good. You know, and yeah. and I'll try try it again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. And I thought, that's a thing to do, really. You know, it's, it's there and it's there to be utilised, and it went well. So you know, it's, it's all part of something bigger plan, as well. I could say I thought it's part of something. Was drawn towards doing it, and out of the blue, really, it's just a thing that we were pushed towards. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, I think we'll finish off there, Fred. Okay, mate. Yep. Okay. Love it, speech. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Great. Same thing. Take care, Rob. All the best. This has been the World Magic Movement, Episode 1, Destinies, with S. Rob, Saul Ravencraft, Freddie Valentine. Production designed by MythMade Productions, produced by S. Rob. Music, A Dark Blue Arc, by Pipe Choir. Find them at freemusicarchive.org. This program is licensed for sharing under the Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 4.0 international. For more details about usage and sharing, see links in the program description or visit creativecommons.org. This program is licensed 2016 by Werevamp Media Limited. See program description for additional links to guest sites and supporting information.